Welcome back to the program, you beautiful people. It has certainly been a hot minute, and in case you've forgotten, my name is Dr. Dan, and I'm a pharmacist turned weight management specialist. Now, we're going to continue on with this series talking about the brain and how it affects our eating patterns and behaviors. You know, we've talked about the primal brain, we've talked about the modern brain, and this is part five of, well, I really don't know how many, so fuck it. This is my YouTube channel, and it's going to be as many parts as I want it to be. And of course, before I dive into everything, hit the subscribe button down below so that you don't miss another episode as well. Check me out on my other channels at the official Dr. Dan. We're on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, you name it, we are out there. As well, check out my website, healthcareevolve.ca, if you're looking for some additional support. So up to this point, we've got parts one through four. We've talked about the primal brain. We've talked about the modern brain, all the different aspects and components that are involved there. Today, I want to talk a little bit about how we mitigate and start managing some aspects of our brain in order to manage our weight. Now, there's always going to be components of our brain, our behaviors, and our habits that we're really not going to have a whole lot of control over. They're just things that are genetically conferred, environmental factors, things that we've learned from childhood that are going to drive some of our behaviors, but we can still have some influence and ultimately support our ability to say, choose the apple over the apple pie more frequently. Now, today we're going to talk about how we can influence the old man primal brain, as I find this one tends to be, well, the easier one to mitigate and manage, or at least the most tangible, if you will. It's really more about implementing strategies and different ideas versus dealing with the messiness of our thoughts, feelings, and emotions. So you're, you're welcome for that one, and hopefully there will be no tears shed today. So as we reviewed in parts one to four, which again, if you haven't seen them, I highly suggest you go and watch them. What we reviewed there is that the primal brain's sole function is to keep you alive. How do I prevent this human from dying in the next five minutes? Now, it's constantly monitoring your environment, making sure that everything is in balance, or homeostasis is the medical biological term, we'll say. It's kind of like Yoda monitoring the balance of the force, and if something is out of balance, guaranteed will let us know he will. That was either Yoda speak or just really bad grammar. One of the two, I will let you decide. So if you're cold, the primal brain is going to tell you to go turn up the furnace so you get more heat. If you're hungry, it's going to tell you to go find some food. And the primal brain is very presently focused. It really doesn't care when that massive heating bill comes in the mail or when you have a heart attack because of the eight Big Macs you just crushed. It's only thinking about the next five minutes, the next hour, very, very focused on the present. Therefore, what we need to focus on with the primal brain is keeping everything in balance. How do we keep the balance, the homeostasis to keep the primal brain happy? And what I refer to this as is maintaining or managing the biological needs of the brain. So when it comes to managing biology, there is one particular part of the brain that's really involved in this process, and what it is called is the hypothalamus. Now the hypothalamus is found within the deep recesses of the brain. You can see it highlighted in this picture right here. And while it is small, it has a very mighty role. It controls everything from your sex drive, to your body temperature, to your weight, to your feeding behaviors. And it is one of the components of your primal brain. And I like to think of it having a very binary function, either yes, we do something or no, we don't. So if you've gone a long time without food, the hypothalamus is going to receive a signal from the body that is something like body hungry, feed me. It's then going to take that signal and send it to other parts of the brain, in particular, the mesolimbic reward center of the brain, which is kind of our primary food seeking driver behavior, feel good area of our brain. And it's going to say body hungry, must find food. Now, obviously, the signaling and conversation is much more complex and I'm sure is much more sophisticated. But hey, I think it's a lot more fun to think of it as a caveman in your brain versus Benedict Cumberbatch sipping on a cup of tea. Now, to further my point between the hypothalamus and the mesolimbic reward center of the brain here, the hypothalamus isn't the one that's saying, go and find the pizza. Pizza is amazing and delicious. No, that's being driven entirely by the hedonistic mesolimbic reward center of your brain. The hypothalamus just sends an order to the mesolimbic reward center of the brain that is something like, we need food, go find. I'm not entirely sure what happened to the caveman voice there, but uh, again, it's my YouTube channel, so fuck it, we're gonna go with it. Now, if the hypothalamus never received a signal from the body that said, we are hungry, go find food, it would never send a signal to the mesolimbic reward center of the brain to push us to go and find food. 
Now, obviously, it's going to be impossible to shut down that signaling altogether because if you never got that signal to go and find food, eventually you would just starve to death and die because that signal would not be going through. So we can't get rid of that signaling altogether, but we can help to manage it and reduce it and make it something that's a little bit more in our control. So in general, there are three guidelines, rules, guideposts, whatever the hell you wanna call them that I focus on with my clients. Number one, protein, 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 protein. Number two, eating consistently throughout the day. And number three is eating a minimum amount of calories every single day. Now, yes, the signaling between the hypothalamus and the body is much more complex and intricate and involves insulin levels, leptin levels, fat cells, etc. But ultimately, focusing on these three components really helps to simplify it down and are three things that are tangible, easy to think about, and are ultimately going to play a role on all those various signaling mechanisms and stuff like that. So don't at me if you're one of these healthcare provider keyboard warriors that's saying I'm oversimplifying it. I, I, yes, I am, I am fully aware. That is what the point of this video is. Anyways, let's talk about protein, the king of the macronutrients. And for today, I really don't want you to get caught up into how much protein. I'm gonna review that in a little bit more detail in a future video. Today, I just want you to think of it more as how can I make protein the focus or the center of each of my meals and snacks? For example, chicken for dinner. Okay, chicken is at the center. How much chicken do we wanna have? Is it gonna be you know, two palm sizes? Is it gonna be one palm size, whatever? But that's the main focus. And then, hey, what are we gonna have as a starch? What are we gonna have as a veggie or what have you? But ultimately, if your protein intake is too low, your hypothalamus is going to get all kinds of signals and alarms and the body is going to be saying, we need protein, we're out of protein, give us protein. And so it's going to be sending that signal to the hypothalamus to essentially trigger you to go find it. And so there's a couple of reasons for this. Number one, your body really can't store protein. We can store carbohydrates in the form of glycogen in our muscles and our liver. We obviously can store fat in terms of fat cells, but protein, we really don't have a storage reservoir. So we need to continually eat protein throughout the day in order to ensure that our body is getting an adequate amount of protein so that our cells can do the cell things. Now, the second reason is, and the reason why protein really is the king of the macronutrients, is that protein can be converted into carbohydrates and fat if your body needs them. And on the flip side, carbohydrates and fats can only be used to create some of the proteins and amino acids that you need. The rest of the protein and amino acids that you need have to come from your diet. In terms of eating consistently, this is obviously going to vary between individuals. And no, I'm not talking about eating six meals, eight meals a day or whatever like that to ramp up your metabolism. This has absolutely no scientific basis and to be quite honest is a bunch of bullshit. We want to eat consistently throughout the day, whether it's two or eight meals per day, in order to make sure that, number one, we're getting enough protein going into our system to do the cell things, but also to just manage our hunger through the day. Again, when your body goes long periods of time without any calories or food, the body is going to be sending signals to the hypothalamus and saying, this asshat hasn't eaten in 18 hours. Can you please go make them eat some food? And guess what? This signal is going to be sent to the hypothalamus and thus the hypothalamus to the mesolimbic reward center, regardless if you actually feel hunger. So if you feel the grumbling in your stomach or not, that signal is still being sent. Generally, if you wait until your stomach is full on grumbling and growling, at that point in time, it's too late and the mesolimbic reward center of your brain is starting to narrow in on the highest calorie dense food it can possibly find. And it might be McDonald's on the way home. It might be the donut in the break room. Nonetheless, it is narrowing in and focusing on to where that food is and trying to start you to get to have it. So this is the reason why eating consistently through the day can be beneficial. It helps to dampen down that signaling. Now, as I said, there is no advantage between eating two times a day or eight times a day. It really doesn't matter. It's going to fundamentally whatever works for you and your schedule. Generally, when I work with people, we aim for maybe three to four, maybe more times per day. And that's kind of like your three main meals and then maybe some snacks. Again, depends on you, your day and that sort of thing. And sorry to the intermittent fasting groups, and this is part of the reason why I would say intermittent fasting really doesn't work for like 99% of people eventually. Now, eating a minimum amount of calories. I know this one sounds a little bit weird and don't know where it's really coming from, but just stay with me here. And what I mean by this is that we essentially want to eat enough calories in order to keep the proverbial lights of our body on. 
We need to have enough energy in order to digest our food, keep our heart going, keep breathing, and to poop. And you might hear people call this your basal metabolic rate or your BMR. So for me, a 31-year-old male that's 5'10", about 200 pounds or so, my BMR is approximately 1,800 calories per day. So that's the amount of calories my body is going to burn by just existing. And if my energy intake falls below that 1800 or even remotely close to that, to be quite honest, I become what one at the best could say is a cranky Kathy. Now, to find out what your BMR is, because I know a number of you are going to ask that, if you just type in BMR calculator via Google, you're going to get like a bazillion hits. There's various different formulas and calculations. Don't get too caught up in that again. Just see what the original one is and go from there. So your basal metabolic rate of calories is basically the minimum amount of calories that I usually recommend for anybody. And even then, most of us, or 99% of us anyways, are actually going to need more than that to prevent us from, well, murdering people, but to also help us in losing weight. And that's right. As I always say, 1,200 calories per day does not work for weight loss. If we get near or below your basal metabolic rate of calorie intake, your hypothalamus is going to be basically receiving a mob of signals, kind of like people that are trampling each other to get TVs on Boxing Day. Now, another point that I want to bring up here is when I say a minimum, it's because, well, life. You see, life involves food. Food is a part of our culture, our celebrations. It plays a role in all of our social gatherings and really all of our societal constructs that we've come up with up to this point in time. It's very, very important. Therefore, there's going to be days where you're going to eat more calories. And so we don't put a maximum amount of calories that you can have because some days I expect you to eat more calories. If you're skipping cake on your birthday because you feel you need to in order to lose weight, you are doing it wrong. Anyways, that all seems relatively simple, right? Now, many people are going to want to jump in to overhaul their entire life. I'm going to highly recommend against this. We want to start implementing these things in a stepwise fashion, one small step at a time. So start slow and maybe start with adding some protein to a snack or having a protein snack somewhere throughout your day if you feel you need to. And then try adding some protein to lunch. And maybe you're at 1,200 calories a day right now. Maybe we'll go up to 1,300 calories per day for a week. And then we'll go up to 1,400 and so on and so forth. A lot of these changes are going to seem very foreign and counterintuitive to what you've done in the past, and hell, it's probably going to be scary as hell. But if we start slow, we can start to slowly and progressively incorporate them and build on top of them so it's not as overwhelming and it's not as scary. And if we slowly start to incorporate these, we can ultimately reduce the signaling and how much is going to the hypothalamus and ultimately the mesolimbic reward center of our brain, and we can keep that old man primal brain good and happy. Now, hopefully the above all makes sense, and not to worry, I will kind of delve into those various components or those three things in more detail in future videos, probably not part of this part 10 series or whatever, but we will get into it in more detail so that you guys can have a better understanding of that and so you can get the full picture as to what kind of changes if you get stuck along the way you might need to do. So that is it for today, you beautiful people. That is part five, talking about how we manage the old man primal brain. I probably only got one more part in me for this series right here, and then we'll dive into some other topics and such. But nonetheless, to make sure you don't miss out on the next part or any other future videos, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below. And of course, check me out on my other channels at the official. Dr. Dan. We're on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, you name it, we are out there. As well, check out the website healthcarevolve.ca where you can get more details as well. If you need to, you can book a free consult with myself. And as always, everybody, don't forget that small tweaks lead to massive peaks.